Everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Panthers Brawl Podcast. As always, alongside Sean T. Stewart, I'm Jack Taylor. As we said, Tyler and Jeff are out this week, but we are joined by a very special guest, Mr. Kevin Donnelly. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on today. Glad to be here. Always a good excuse to come out to uh, Old Beckenberg Brewery. So. It's such a beautiful place, and yeah. thankfully it's not that cold, because we were here last night yeah. scouting it out, and it was freezing. The wind was bad. Yeah, it was, it was nice awful. Night, yeah. I, had, I was wearing like two jackets. It was, it was awful. But um, So, obviously you played for the Dolphins, Panthers, and Titans. Am I missing anybody? Well, before the Titans was the Houston Oilers when they moved oh, to Tennessee. Exactly. Yes, Same sir. franchise, but different name. <laughs> what was it like in that transition? Uh, it was uh, it was difficult because um, Bud Adams, the owner of the team, um, basically owned the Houston Oilers and been trying to get the Astrodome renovated several different times. Had some renovations done, but really wanted to, to do another round of renovations. The city really didn't want to do anything about it, so he had threatened to leave several times. Mm-hmm. Um, finally, the city was kind of like, okay, fine, go get your best offer. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Um and he uh, got a great offer from Tennessee. They moved the franchise. Jeff Fisher was the coach at the time. Oh, my gosh. He, did, he actually did a phenomenal job of transitioning us from, really? from Houston to Nashville because um, that last year in Houston, we knew we were moving. So the last game of the year, I think we had 16,000 fans in a 65,000-seat stadium. Um, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, there was no home field advantage. It was, it was tough. I think we still had a decent year of 7-9. So getting to Nashville, uh, a couple of tough years there. We had to play in Memphis one year. Yeah, really? Then I didn't know that. Memphis at the Liberty Bowl. Wow. Then that wasn't great. So <laughs> we had, still didn't have the stadium in Nashville. So the team played at Vanderbilt. And then after that, the new stadium was built. And um, they took off after that. Because uh, that first year in the stadium, we got a Super Bowl run and, and nearly got it to one more yard. And you know, maybe they got a Super Bowl ring. How, how would you describe that fan base in Nashville? Nashville with it being such a, you know, just a different market to put a professional team. Yeah, I think in some ways it's it's a lot like Charlotte uh, and the fact that, you know, we've got country music, there's a lot of health care, you know, for here, you know, NASCAR, banking, uh, they're both really growing cities, uh, but they're not, you know, what we call one of the top major cities in the country, so you're going to have fans that come, um, you know, when, when the team's doing well, they're going to be all about it, um, this year you can really see it, I mean, they were behind their team and I think they've been craving it because they all got a taste of it when the team first moved to the new stadium mm-hmm. in Nashville. Mm-hmm. And then it's uh, you know, a lot of years of 7-9 and nine with, with Jeff Fisher. And, and how many times did they lose to the Chargers in the wild card race? I know. I feel I like know. it was like four years in a row and they kept losing to the Chargers in the wild card. LaDamian Tomlinson would run all over them. My dad would pace around. Well, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> um, it's so difficult in the NFL. We always, everyone in the business says it. I mean, it's to, to try and have sustained success and get to the playoffs. Um, you know, there's the Patriots and just kind of everybody else. Mm, yeah. um, so that's what everybody's trying to shoot for. But um, I love Mike Crable. I think he's done a great job. It seems like the team toughness is there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Defense is solid. I love what they did with their rushing attack. Wouldn't you love to block for Derrick Henry? <laughs> yeah. And I, I know a guy that gets to do that for him. Um, Rookie right guard, Nate Davis. Okay, yeah. Uh, was at UNC Charlotte. I, I worked up I at the UNC Charlotte football program. Yeah, he was um, Maybe I didn't second, know that. Yeah. second player ever drafted out of UNC yeah. Charlotte. Uh, the first one was Larry Ogunjobi, plays for the Browns. I don't even know they if were, I know that. They were both uh, third-round picks. Okay. Um, so we're Charlotte teams were excited. Yeah. We got another one in there. But, I mean, this guy went in. Nate went in as a rookie. And played phenomenal, got better every game. And, I mean, his rookie year is in the AFC Championship game against the Chiefs. Mm, yeah, that's insane. It is. Um, so it was a great experience. So it's it's really cool. Um, I, I wish I had been on some of those franchises back in Nashville. I'd left for a free agency to go down to the Dolphins. Mm. But um, I think it's a great sports town. Mm. Uh, you see what they do for the Reds. So, yeah, oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I think if they can stack together a few playoff seasons here, mm. uh, those fans will be just rabid. And because the Preds were doing really, really well. I mean, they were in the Stanley Cup Finals not two, three years ago. And the cool part about Nashville is literally you go, you have Bridgestone Arena at the top of the street, basically. 
all bars and country music clubs to the end of the street, then you cross the bridge, and that's Nissan Stadium. It's literally that one whole street. I've been a couple times because, as you know, Jeff, my dad is a Titans fan, and so, and I actually covered a couple SEC hockey tournaments in, uh, they would play it in the Ford Ice uh, Arena, the Preds uh, Practice Arena, but Nashville is such a cool town, and that's honestly not a bad place to be a sports journalist, I feel like. Yeah, it's, um, it's a great setup. It's very unique in the NFL to have, you know, you want the, the stadium downtown, if you can have it, I think people are moving to the city center now, wherever they're, they're at, so the Panthers, where theirs is, is just a prime location. Mm. Um, I know the new owner here is kind of hinted at mm-hmm. getting a new stadium or having a, like a big refurbishment or whatever, but um, I recently visited Nashville maybe about a month ago mm-hmm. and uh, was at a, a really good restaurant. There were so many fans there mm-hmm. early. Mm-hmm. They were getting, they wanted to get the Predators game as quick as they could and it was just walking distance to mm-hmm. head on over there. And it's, it's such a cool environment that you, know, you can go from the fall with these great games and, and hang out with Second Street down there in Broadway and then go to the game and when it rolls around you've got the Predators and you know, into the, the spring depending on how and yeah, especially having the draft there this past fall I mean, or this past summer I, did you attend it all? I did not oh, but, just seeing it all? yeah it I, was, mean, I mean 600,000 people it was insane yeah. thinking about how packed Broadway already is yeah. when there's not people walking through the streets but they closed out the entire street I mean it was people back as far as the eye can see yeah. now what are your thoughts about it being in, in uh, is Vegas? Is Vegas, Vegas. Yeah, with, the, with the boats yeah, bringing the players yeah, in the, the first down. round up to the podium. I, I hope there's not too many moving parts. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like, um, there's just so much that can go on and you want things that are under your control. So I'm sure they're going to rehearse it and make sure everything is moving smoothly. Mm-hmm. The last thing you want is, man, we thought the boat would carry yeah. 330-pound defensive lineman and his family or whatever you need to go <laughs> yeah. up there. I, I'm not, it's hard to picture exactly how it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, that's what Vegas is about, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's taking risks and having yeah. fun and pushing it to the limit. Yeah, and I mean, they're, gamble some. they're doing that with the new stadium. I mean, the stadium looks insane. It doesn't even—it looks like something out of like Tron or something. Yeah. It's wild. But um, so talking about you said so for the, through free agency, you went to Miami, spent what I think it was two, three, three, three years there. Okay, and then obviously the main topic we're going to talk about moving to talk about the transition to the Panthers. How did that come about? Well, I played uh, ten seasons through um, my three years there in Miami. And uh, body's getting older, and you know, you start to think in your head, you know, is it time to retire? Mm-hmm. Um, but the old line coach I had with the Miami Dolphins uh, actually moved on to the Carolina Panthers, um, and he wanted to kind of reshape the room that he had and had some younger players in there. Mm-hmm. And so I was the old veteran that I knew his system, I knew how he liked things done, how he coached, mm-hmm. and so I think that's a big reason it was a big draw. On, um, so it, it kind of re-energized me. You know, I'm like, I want to, I want to keep going now and then see if we can build something special in Carolina. And the first year was rough, one in fifteen. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's about one of the worst teams we've had. George Seifert's last season, and, um, and I, I will say, I feel a little bit bad for George Seifert because the owner wanted to kind of go younger and, and you know, make the change of quarterback with Steve Burlein leaving and then trying to get Jeff Lewis in there and it ends up being Chris Wanky. Um, you know, he wasn't bad for a rookie quarterback. Um, we just, we, we were, if you look back at those 15 losses, a lot of them were very close. Um, they were battling. They weren't, they weren't getting blown out. They weren't trash. It's just, we couldn't buy a break. Um, but that set us up for 2002, we draft Julius Peppers, um, you know, and then the draft the Seifert did have, and then it gave us, I think, Dan Morgan and Steve Smith, um, some other really good players, so um, those couple of lean years really helped us that third season to get to the Super Bowl. And, and if you could, can you talk about, like, how big is it to be that veteran presence in a young in a young position room? I, know, I, don't think, I don't think a lot of people understand how critical that could be for young players in their development in, in the league. It, it really is because, um, you know, my time period when I was playing, it was a complicated game. But now uh, colleges are so much more sophisticated. These guys are coming out uh, with a better knowledge of the game. But that allows these new coordinators and, and coaches in the NFL to make things even more sophisticated. Uh, they can run things quicker and more fast-paced. So there's a lot going on. Uh, and it's really hard for rookies to come in there and, and make a big impact. Um, you can see usually there's a lot of flashes of brilliance, but then 
you know, it could be five games, you don't see much from them. So really having some uh, veteran leadership, I think those guys are important to, to keep guys focused, um, to let them know it's a long season, to push them when, when times are tough, when you got to banged up or things like that. And, um, so with the way this Panthers team is now, a lot of veterans are going out the door and then some guys that don't have contracts that become free agents. I'm not sure how many they're interested in re-signing. I'll say we have about, what, 16 unrestricted, I yeah. think, we're going into the season. And... We've been, we've been talking about that because there is a you ha, you have to budget your money you have to give some certain players certain money and it comes to players like we talked about it a lot James Bradbury that was a player that we thought depending on how much money he's asking for we, that's one of those players we don't know if we need to, if that's where that money should go because we're kind of at a discrepancy for it yes it it really is interesting because you know when you look at guys like Mario Addison you can absolutely see him having value and having him around because of his leadership. Is he part of the core that you know you can count on in three years? Exactly. It seems like the time frame's been set by Mr. Tepper. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be this year, next year. Be patient. Stay on board. Be big fans. We're going to get there. We're going to do it the right way. So you start to look at the roster and say, of oh, the pieces you want to keep, what's their age, where they have their career, because you can build this thing that suddenly they're ready to walk out the door. You know, time, Father Time is catches up to everybody. Except for maybe Brady. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's evaded long enough. In certain positions. You know, yeah, exactly. But um, those are four guys that have been very productive and still can be, but will they be in two, three years? So that makes it tough. You know, I think basically you got to look at the roster and say, who are the guys we absolutely have to have? Um, I think they did that late last season when um, Shaq Thompson got his new deal. Yeah. Um, and I know they didn't Keekly's retirement was coming, and now it seems even more brilliant that they at least have him locked up. And there's one really good solid linebacker back there that they can build around. I think, I think you talked about it a little bit ago. I think, you know, you saw the spurts of excellence or greatness from a rookie, and then you don't see him for five or six or games. Obviously, I don't think it was in part of him because he was injured a little bit. But Brian Burns, kind of that same way where he made a huge wave in that first quarter of the season, and then I, whether it was, you know, the, the lineups that we were using, the formations we were using, or for whatever reason thinking that he needed to spend more time on special teams, we didn't really see him that much more anymore. And obviously he had a little bit of injury, but I think that's something you can talk about to where that's why Shaq is so important. I think Burns can be that guy. But then you have these people, especially with the defensive formation we're running, we re-ran last year, where we kept going back and forth between the two because we wanted to set on this new formation. And we started to realize that really, without Thomas Davis, it starting, didn't really work out. So It was out of sync. Yeah, it really was. It just yeah. didn't seem like the formidable defenses that the Panthers have had. In the yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I think with Coach Rivera, last nine years, and um, he's a great coach, he got us to a Super Bowl, a lot of playoffs, um, but there was that tendency to not play a lot of young guys, uh, if you think back just last year, uh, 2018, DJ Moore, it's almost like the fans had to, had to pick him, yeah. yeah. hey, <laughs> come on, this guy in, because he's a first round pick, pick, and he's a huge talented, and you saw he got really good, better, better as the season went on, and now he's doing really well, um, I think it was a big move for him to play Burns a little bit early, but then... Maybe fell back into his his old ways because uh, Bruce Irvin was dinged up at the beginning mm-hmm. here. And you think back, but maybe the only reason he really even put him in there is because he had to. Yeah. Because Bruce Irvin wasn't able to get in there. And think Bruce, of that. Bruce was taking a lot more of those reps. Coach Rivera just likes veterans. He, he nothing likes wrong with I mean, he can, he can trust. Um, think about all that Super Bowl team was. Yeah. That Super Bowl team had Jared Allen, Charles Tillman. I think that had no Roman Harper wasn't on that team. Roman Harper was on the was he on that? He was on that Super Bowl team. Uh, let's see. I mean, you had you had Olsen, Jack Thompson, Luke Keekly. Um, Norman. Still had like Khalil on that team. You still had Trey Turner. Yeah, my word. Trey Boston was on it. Yeah, we had him back. I said. Yeah, we signed Corlin Finnegan. We had, yeah, we had signed Corlin Finnegan. I forgot about Corlin. And then after that, signed Captain Munnell and brought yeah. back brought him back to the team. I'm interested to see your thoughts on on Marty Herney. I mean, obviously when Gettleman left, we needed some sort of someone to be that fill that role. And when he was when he was when he was hired, everyone was like, okay, interim. Like he understands the team. He knows what he's doing. That's not a bad idea. 
and then we thought it was just going to be an interim period, and then it turned out to be, you know, for the long run, and then when Tepper came and started, you know, flushing out the staff and revitalizing everything, we thought, okay, Rivera's gone, Herney's probably not far behind, because again, he was just that interim. What are your thoughts on the fact that he's still with the team? How do you, how do you think about that? How do you feel about um, that? You know, he's had, he's had an above average um, grade, I think, as a, a draft. Especially the ones you want to hit on, he's hit. Yeah. Um, second, third, fourth round picks, hit or miss. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's, it's not like he's got a, a brilliant track record, but he's done well enough. And, you know, general managers, uh, I don't know what direction he's going to go. I don't really have a feel what Mr. Tepper is going to do, but I'll say, you know, general managers can kind of be hired draft to draft time and it's not a right after the season type of deal because they've been working months and months on this year's draft yeah. so for them technically it feels like 2019 is not over yet until the draft yes that's true yeah and I didn't think about that the scouts when the season's over and playoffs are going the Super Bowl's done through the combine they're still getting their boards ready of who they're going to draft and you don't want to bring somebody in new and Spratting kind of put a new guy into the whole mix mm-hmm. when you've got grades on players you got to trust your scouts that, that they're evaluating the talent mm-hmm. um, so it's it's a big draft um, you know he's got to hit on some of these guys um, but Mr. Tepper has slowly and systematically gotten his people into the organization mm-hmm. it wasn't anything where he came in and cleaned house yeah um, started with some bigger names and higher up positions and then it's um, you know, there's still guys that are you know they're basically being fired now in, in some lesser roles that um, you know, I would have thought maybe would have been done six months ago so you know he's a tough businessman he's made a lot of money so I think he he knows business and what he needs to do to get the franchise where it needs to go. So, to me, you know, with Marty, who knows? Yeah. Mr. Tepper knows. Because um, <laughs> right when you get a beat on something and you think he, he's going one way, he'll, he'll go a whole other direction. Yeah, that's for sure. And just to kind of double back to Ron Rivera, do you think that him being so, you know, leaning towards older guys, do you think that became his undoing towards the end of his tenure in Carolina? Uh, I think I think he's still going to have some really good seasons. Uh, the Cam Newton thing is, it hurt the whole staff. Yeah. It hurt the franchise, it hurt fan support. Um, this team really jumped onto the national map in 2011 when they drafted Cam Newton. Yeah. He is a polarizing character. You know, people either love him or hate him, but everyone's talking about him. Yeah. And the fans time. were in the seats because they wanted to be there when he did the you know, flip score over the Houston Texans um, in that game, or he's, you know, dunking it over the yeah. Falcons oh. player. Or, you know, all these great plays that you only saw from Cam Newton. Yeah. And him being e- injured the last two seasons um, to one degree or another, um, you just saw less fans there. I will say in 2018, he was dinged up, not playing his best, but the, the fan support was still really there because up until he couldn't throw anymore, yeah. he finally had to kind of put him down. Um, you know, those fans were there to, to see some greatness, and they were hoping it would, it would come about. So that's a huge question for this team yeah. going forward. But I think that was, you know, that was just something that happens that's out of your control. And when your best player and the most important player on every NFL franchise is hurt on the bench and having to watch, it's not going to be good for anybody, especially the win total. And, you know, that's the bottom line. When you talked about it, you know, not seeing a whole lot of fans in the seats this year. I know one of the biggest moments that I saw it, and uh, my dad saw it as well because he was working the game, was the Panthers-Titans game. I mean, it was 65 and sunny on a Sunday at 1 o'clock, and no one was there. I mean, and I know at the time that wasn't as a big of a matchup as, it looks, as we look back on it now because the way the Titans rolled after that, I mean, that was still, I think that was one of Tannehill's first games, and I think one of his very few losses. But I think that was very telling when you have, you can't, like, because the couple weeks before, we were either away or it was raining, kind of bad weather, but yep. there was no excuse there. Mm-hmm. And I just, it's it's saddening to see. And I think that might be playing a part, as you said, into why it's taken so long for them to say whether or not, you know, they're with Cam or not. Because I think they're realizing without Cam, now without Keekly, without Olsen, 
really only the cat pack is the thing bringing people into the seats. Yeah. And as a businessman for Tepper, you know, he's not going to make that call right away. And then, you know, people start, all right, sell their season tickets, sell their, their PSLs right out of the gate because he knows it's going to hurt, hurt the business. Yeah. It's, it's crazy this, the way this just you know, four years ago they're in the Super Bowl yeah. and their captains are, are Keekly, Ham, Ryan Khalil, Thomas Davis, um, and, Gre- uh, uh, and Cre- uh, Charles Johnson, I think, was the last captain. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Cam's the last guy. You know, in just four seasons, all your captains, except for Cam, are gone, and we don't even know if Cam's going to be back. Um, so I think that's that's something I think Mr. Tepper's really trying to to make the message to the fan. It's going to be rough for a while. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of young players that will have some periods of brilliance. But it's, it's, it's going to be tough. There's at least some empty seats. But, you know, for him, the long-range plan is sustain greatness, sustain um, you know, consistency over time and getting to the playoffs more than just every other year. Um, being consistently in that contention, you know, going into week 16 or 17 and maybe possibly got a playoff run or even winning the division and getting a bye. Yeah. Um, so right now it's, you know, it's, with all that veteran leadership gone, you know, you're going to have to depend on you know, DJ Moore in his third year. Uh, Taylor Moat is going to be his fourth season off the yeah, yeah. Um, Trey Turner's going to have to step up in a really big way. Um, being a seven, seven year guy, maybe. K1 Short. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing with Rivera. I mean, yeah, losing K1. That hurts losing me so much. Losing, yeah. Because then that really, that was the most exciting part about the season was that defense, was that front seven. Other than losing Davis, you still had, you knew he had rookie Burns, Addison. We knew he could play that kind of hybrid, and Irvin has played that hybrid most of his career. And then you have, okay, they're either going to have to double, they're either going to have to double team to Short, McCoy, or Poe. They're, they can't do all three, so you figured someone was going to throw. I think it was that lack of being able to create. I mean, the beginning of the season, we had a good amount of sacks, but then the lack of being able to create that pressure, and then just the sheer amount of yards we got up running the ball. I mean, that's ne- that's something I've never seen, except for maybe one or two games, but it was like every game. We were letting guys go 10, 15 yards into the second level before anyone could touch them, and I think that's what, because the state, I think that's what, honestly, was the end for Rivera, was the last, you know, straw, was that his trademark, like you said, has been these defensive powerhouses. I mean, even in the Super Bowl year, our defense was still leading the league in you know turnovers. It was leading the league in you know yards allowed and points allowed. That was our our trademark. And then we've always had it. The Panthers for the last decade or so have had teams where the offense has sort of relied on the defense per se. And yeah. this was the first year that <laughs> neither team, neither side was above the other. They were just both kind of dealing with issues. Um, you look at, at any good team in the NFL that makes a huge run in the playoffs. They're dominant on one side or the other. Mm-hmm. And then they're at least above average. And you, know, you take a team like the Kansas City Chiefs. Offense is spectacular. The defense improved, improved as the season went along. Okay. But it was not a top 10 defense. No. Um, you know, teams that they're going against. You, know, you look at um, the Titans, you know, in that game. Absolute beast running the ball. Mm-hmm. Uh, best running, one of the best running teams in the league. Oh, yeah. And then that defense was... You know, very, very good. Mm-hmm. Not dumb. But you got to have some kind of combination. When and, and every team has these limits with you know the amount of players you have, the salary mm-hmm. cap, um, all these different limitations. So it's a level playing field. And everyone would love to have the perfect team. You know, their kicker hits it through every time. Their quarterback's Tom Brady. Their defense has you know old greats like Lawrence Taylor to Luke Kuechly to uh, you know. Reed and, and point at uh, safety and say all these different players that you love, but you can't have it all. Yeah. And so what the Rivera had really for a long time, besides the 2015 season, was the bad offense was just brilliant and yeah. the defense was great. But you always had that defense to really count on to get them through games and help muscle their way through some tough victories. Yeah. Uh, and it got them into the mix, but this year was, um, the offense was a little sporadic at times. Was brilliant with Christian McCaffrey, but on the defense, like you said, couldn't stop anybody. Oh, it couldn't. And I think you know we transition to a new system. We're trying to incorporate three-four and a four-three. There's going to be some learning curve to it. Uh, and then you lose that big piece like they were short. I think that was a huge blow oh, yeah. to that yeah. transition. And I think you know we saw Luke Kuechly retire. You know he didn't. He was kind of saying my body was done. He had kind of been through it. He didn't 
didn't mention any specifically, and I think a lot of people would like to, you know, the concussions, the concussions, but he's kind of a throwback player in that he had sore shoulders, banged up elbows, hurt wrists, and how many times you're watching the game close enough, you see he's holding the elbow but going back to the huddle. He's holding his wrist and wincing, and you're scared like he's coming out but never comes out. And I think for him, uh, it made a difference that, you know, when he's attacking something and he's supposed to get his shoulder on one side to get the tackle back and the ball carrier down, he's usually brilliant at it, but he's picking the other shoulder because the shoulder's banged up. Yeah. And there weren't anything that was a whole lot that went on the, the injury report yeah. because he's kind of an old school throwback guy. He's, he's not going to tell anybody. No yeah. What, and, um, and I think that just played into it. There was the cumulative effect of all those yeah. injuries that he wasn't quite at his best and, and that's when he knew he felt like if he couldn't play that way you know, it was time to walk away I think it was very telling to see too I think they underestimated per se how much of an impact Thomas Davis had in for, as far as a leadership role with Keekley because you saw every game I mean Keekley was running four corners of the defense trying to tell everybody what to do and it, it looked like he was going to have an aneurysm every time it was third it was third down and so I think that also played a huge part where he was just not only physically exhausted but mentally exhausted too he was like I cannot do this by myself this way yeah. because I mean you had and especially without KK because you have KK is kind of controlling things on the line and TD was kind of helping maybe he was you know calling giving calls to the DBs or something of that nature or at least helping Keekly out you know so he didn't have to cover that entire middle of the field from hash to hash but this year I mean, he really did he was yeah. making a, almost every tackle um, one thing I do want to oh, well, just mention about you know Thomas Davis um, phenomenal player um, he really was like Keekly was, was kind of the foundation of that defense but, but Thomas Davis was the heart and soul mm. and his pregame you know, I, I to sideline radio um, the last year he was he was there so I'm always kind of hanging around the locker room hanging out on the sideline seeing and it was his leadership in terms of the energy and the juice that he brought every day and even at practice you know I think chirping at Cam Newton getting things kind of riled up getting the competitiveness going you know you just didn't see a whole lot of that this year and it's one thing to say okay we're gonna get rid of this player um because we think that you know we need Shaq Thompson to grow yeah and Shaq could be a great player in his own right but I mean, I'll tell you, he's not the same as Thomas Davis in terms of juice so they're gonna have to draft somebody or a free agent or someone that comes in there because I don't, I don't see anybody besides maybe a, a Trey Boston who was doing a whole lot of talking oh yeah. No, yeah really and you know just kind of go back to shoot back to David Tepper a little bit you know he came from that Steeler foundation of you know building with a strong head coach and building it, the thick and thin you go you, you roll with the head coach and you, and you get the job done with that guy you know with him doing that now it's a, it's a totally different era now from when as long as he's with, with, with the Steelers, this is a totally different era of football where, you know, things kind of move quickly. You don't, you don't see many coaches get those long seven-year deals like he gave Matt Rowe, especially a guy coming straight out of college. You think that that may just be a little bit of, um, you know, like a, very, a very aggressive move or, like, you, you think it was like a calculated – you think it's a, a very calculated or a smart move to make towards the future? Yeah, you know, coming from an organization that's been around forever and has only had three head coaches. Yeah. You know, um, it's just crazy. And they won Super Bowls with each coach. Uh, so the Steelers have done an amazing job at that. I think that the franchises that roll coaches over and they're not happy, um, either part of it's not making a really good decision on the head coach to start with, but then not keeping up with, with the commitment because it's, it's, we're in a world, everything needs to be fast and now yeah. and, and microwave. You know, it's, I want to cooked instantly and, and <laughs> yeah. for, yeah. for 10 hours. You know what That's I mean? why I don't cook when I go home. <laughs> That's why I get those microwave like packets. Of, exactly. <laughs> All you millennials, man, you're ruining <laughs> things. All right? So um, I think that um, it, it does take some patience. And I think with him signing a long-term deal with uh, Matt Rule, you know, that was a step for him that's, look, I'm guaranteeing this thing. You know, as long as the, everything's going in the right direction, I'm going to stick with you and let you build it the right way. Um, because I think quick fixes is what gets you in trouble. Yeah. You know, last year, um, you know, we brought in some guys that weren't long-term solutions. Quick fixes, you know, Bruce Irvin. Yeah. Um, you know, guys like that. It's, Chris Hogan. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's about, you know, to 
can this guy bring value not just right away, but even potential and more value down the road? Uh, and it's going to be a, a player that can stick around for a while. I think it takes the pressure off a of rule that, especially the way he's set up, some, the way Mr. Tepper's kind of approached it, and he's made his media appearances or sent letters to PSL holders basically saying, have patience. He's not just telling the fans that, he's telling the head coach, you've got time and build this thing right. So, once you get the foundation and the culture set, how that locker room should look. Um, and I'll just, you know, kind of on a side note, I think that's where there's some little confusion with Cam Newton. Um, part of me thinks it's not the injury situation at all because the shoulder um, was healed and he's at time, yeah. And that didn't get hurt. No. It hurt the foot. It was repaired. Um, Al Olsen did his the last time where it's you do quick fixes, which Olsen tried to do a couple of times, and yeah. it didn't take. Yeah. So he got it fixed the right way. It was a long process, but he made it through the season just fine. Um, part of me kind of wonders if it's, you've got a brand new coach trying to instill a whole new culture, and you want a fast football team, an aggressive football team, one that's going to make fans proud, and you kind of have a quarterback that all the attention has been about him. And sometimes there's not as much of an urgency. And even though he seems great in these big situations, um, you know, sometimes when there's time running out on the clock and he's just kind of slowly getting out of the huddle. And, um, there's always the last one on the field, the last one at the press conference. It's, yeah, I don't know if a rookie head coach in the NFL and a new owner want to saddle that coach with you know, someone that's been in the league for a while and is set in his ways yeah. and really change him into being, you know, I, I think that really wants a little bit of the college flavor yeah. in a professional setting uh-huh. um, where they're teaching, um, but there's a lot of discipline, there's a lot of, you know, this is the way we're going to do it, this is going to be our culture, this is what we're about, and if you can't fit that even if you're a great player might not be here. So. Well, that's, we were talking about that earlier when it came uh, with about Joe Brady because when you know when North came around, you can't. It was kind of North. You're going to create an offense that highlights all of our pieces. You know, the Cat Pack and Cam and keeps everyone guessing. And North was able to change his ways because you know he wasn't calling that kind of offense. I'm starting to think now with Brady coming in as much of an offensive kind of powerhouse as he had in LSU as we saw, it's going to kind of be the other way around. It's going to be, okay, Cam, you have to, you know, shift to this kind of pro style that he likes. And if you can't, I'm afraid that that might push Cam out, whether we want it or not. Because, you, like, you, like you said, you don't want to tether your new head coach and your new offensive coordinator to this quarterback who might be kind of set in his ways and still wants to be, especially because he's still, and it's not a bad thing, but he still wants to be that Superman so bad. Yeah. He's still, and there's nothing wrong with it, but that means if it comes down to I'm maybe waiting to make a pass or I see an opening, try to take it, he might take that opening more often than not, even after all, everything that he's gone through. Yeah. I mean, I hope... From, I mean, from a standpoint, we were talking about, about trade, uh, potential trade scenarios, because if you're going to get rid of him, you need to do it now. I think you need to do it now, because if, he's, if he comes out and he's fully healthy, which I think he is, then his trade value is going to be now. What I would rather than do is wait that year, see if what he does in that first year, because there's only one more year in his contract. You're not going to get a better quarterback in free agency for that little of money and that $19 million. It's just not going to happen. But what are, what are your thoughts about it? Do you think maybe we shop a trade, a, a, a first-round pick, and maybe a B-class player? Or? Well, I think... I really think he's going to be healthy and he's going to have some, some really good years ahead of him. Okay. And Whether it's, it's a or not. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is building for the future, even though we want it quick and we want it next year, teams can bounce back very quickly. Oh, yeah. I mean, who cared about the San Francisco 49ers exactly. just a few years ago? Mm-hmm. Even the, I mean, even the Titans a couple years ago. I mean, they were they, they had that nine and seven, but no one's really talking about them. My day, the Carolina Panthers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 15, seven and nine. Oh, they're, they're right. nothing. In two years, they're they're back a, around. And, and basically, from one and fifteen, two years later, we're in the Super Bowl. Just the same. The only key piece was Jake Delhomme. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that talent was there, and, and he was just. When you got a guy that's a great leader like that, he can push you over the top. And so with this team, what's interesting is it's exactly what you said. That if he does look really, really healthy, does some throwing in March, shows that he can be... I mean, he, need, he needs to do that and the team needs to do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that people know before the end of April when the draft rolls. Exactly. Out. Because that's when his value will be the highest. If he can prove that he's healthy and can make these throws and move around, then... You know, a team that might be close um, and is just looking for that piece, or someone like Vegas 
might want to wow factor. Exactly. Yeah. The Bears yeah. might want to move on from Trubisky. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, San Diego's looking for somebody. Yeah. Just, yeah. There's options. I mean, he, Not even Tampa Bay might go after him. I mean, he could do with the Titans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you? So what are you? Real quick. I'm sorry to sidebar. What are your thoughts on Tannehill? I, my dad's gonna make make me. Yeah, he wants to, I know he's gonna want to know. I liked him a lot. You liked him a lot. I, can he get to that next level? That can the magic is, last? Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what you were saying. No, and it's very few do. Yeah. They're the ones that win Super Bowls. Exactly. And, um, the thing is, he got some good coaching. Had a coach that really believed in him. Mm-hmm. Um, a really good offensive line and a oh, yeah. fantastic running game. Oh yeah. Did he help make that a complete offense that, that helped the running game get better, or was it, you know, him? Benefiting from all these pieces around him, he didn't have in Miami. So I, we were arguing about that earlier. Yeah. With that franchise, exactly. Like, it's basically my favorite team besides the Panthers. <laughs> like, I root for the Panthers, and in the AFC, I root for the Titans. Exactly. That's how I am. Um, I don't know. For me, I felt I feel like another quarterback. That's what we were thinking. Because we were thinking they're about he he made the he made the argument that he doesn't think they're going to make the playoffs next year. I don't believe that because I think the way the division is, I think they could still improve off of their talent. Now, I think they're one piece away from a Super Bowl, and I think that's honestly just the quarterback. So I know that I think Tannehill could still get them in the playoffs next year because I do think he – I mean, you can see there was a spike in offensive improvement as far as passing goes once he got in. I, whether it's just Mariota was that – He's more efficient. He exactly. Receptions, yeah. Made really good choices. Exactly. You know? But that division could get tough really quick. It could. Depending on what the Colts do, really. Like, say, um, down was in San Diego. Um, the quarterback. Oh, Phil Rivers? Yeah, Phil Rivers. <laughs> yeah, Rivers. We went to North Carolina State. I'm yeah. a Tar Heel, so I wanted to forget the name. Exactly. So, let's say he signs for a couple years in Indianapolis. Suddenly, I mean, that's a very good defense. It's an outstanding offensive line. Reinvigorate his career, maybe rejuvenated. Frank Reich's proven to be a really good mm, teacher yeah. of quarterbacks mm-hmm. um, with what he did with the, the two quarterbacks yeah. in Philly and yeah. making that yeah. combo work. I've heard him. more talk about him going to the Bucks because I've heard he's moved his family down there. So what do you think about that? Because, I mean, with Boy Winston was playing. If I'm not mistaken, the part, maybe the part where he's living is maybe the panhandle of uh, Florida. Oh. That it's actually possibly equidistant from his home to Tampa as it is to Tennessee. Oh, oh. it's like six hours each. I don't know. That's the thing. I was we'll an throw a map up major. There. I was not a, a geography major. But oh, you had classes at UNC? <laughs> I was pre. <laughs> whatever that was. I graduated in '91, so I was, I was years away. Oh my gosh. It's like one heck of a turn. Um, and another quick sidebar, because I know it's another thing I'm sure my, my dad would have liked to ask. Who do you think is the better running back, Derrick Henry or Christian McCaffrey? Or do you think it's two different types? Two different types. Okay, that's what he was saying. If I had to pick, I'd take McCaffrey because his youth um, injured I mean, I know Derrick Henry's very young, too, but he's yeah. very physical to that big. But he's 245. I mean, it's just hard. To me, um, I'd love to block for Derrick Henry. Um, <laughs> I was with the Titans when we had Eddie George, oh, and it yeah. was, he was a beast. And one of my favorite human beings of all time. Oh, my God. Every hype he's video he does for the Titans just chills every yeah. time. He made one for the uh, the Ravens game, I think it was, what it was. And he was like, it was the take everything, leave nothing. Yeah. And I was getting just chills. Because I didn't, I forgot about the history between the Titans and the Ravens yeah. going into that game, almost more than, you know, prolific than the Titans and the Chargers that I was aware of, because, you know, there was that, like we said, that four-year... Oh, Eddie George and Ray Lewis oh. had a big rivalry, yeah. and of course, McNair went on. Oh, my goodness. The Ravens. I had a McNair Ravens jersey, actually. We were in Baltimore visiting, because I had... My dad was a huge McNair fan. I mean, I remember one of the first times I saw my dad, like, cry was we were at the beach, and it was wild, because it was that same weekend that Michael Jackson died. That same weekend, so it was Michael Jackson at the beginning, and then it was Steve McNair, and he was just distraught because I mean we have three Titans jerseys we have three McNair jerseys hanging up in our in our bonus room we have a uh, we have an AFC uh, we have a Pro Bowl one and others one and a Titans one because that was just my dad's that was his favorite play
player. And we've got the red. We've got the red Eddie George jersey that they never actually used, um, just because he's just a huge tie. And that's why I found myself. I was getting. I was getting shirt by people on Instagram saying, "You're a fake fan. You're a Panthers fan." I'm like, "No, I've been a Titans fan." Because if you know, you watch football with your dad growing up, you know, and that was if you wanted to see the Titans. I wanted to see the Titans do well, especially since the Panthers were doing anything anymore. I was like, "All right." Titans. And it's funny because my younger my middle my younger brother is actually a Patriots fan, which is a whole different story. But that day, I mean, every he was family has a black. I, <laughs> every family's got that one we don't talk about. But uh, I remember my dad was upstairs and my little brother was downstairs. And you would just hear different screams yeah. of either excitement or cheering when that game came on. But talk about I mean some of the play like some of the players that you got to play with Eddie George, Nick Delhomme, Steve McNair, Steve Smith. Just those yeah, experiences. Well, it's, it's- you know, I started my career in Houston and walking for Warren Moon, and um, a phenomenal quarterback. And then getting to learn from two guys that were on the offensive line, like Munchak and Bruce Matthews, yeah. two Hall of Famers. Um, and just playing with some really great guys there. Then I go to Miami and walking for Dan Marino. And Good Lord. Jesus Christ. And then having to compete and practice every day against uh, Zach Thomas, Jason Taylor. Oh, my word. So it was, yeah. it was great. And then... I always tell people this though is um, I played a long time and used in Oilers and a great quarterback like Warren Moon and Stephen Mayer was there for a while and Eddie George and then going to Miami with Dan Marino and a really good defense and we couldn't quite get there yeah. and then I get to the Panthers and we get to the Super Bowl in 2003 the only time I ever did that in my career and it wasn't with an All Star quarterback no. it was with a band of brothers a team no, farm boy. Played, team football. The, the defense was smart and tough and gave us opportunities when, when defense needed help. We came up with big plays or ran the clock out. And it's just, it was exciting to be part of a team that was that special. It was a lot like the 2015 season for the Panthers. And I think probably a lot of ways for the Titans this year that there weren't a huge amount of expectations there. But you assert the right quarterback, and suddenly the chemistry and the teamwork and everything gelled. Yeah. It's almost like that team, the Cinderella story, team of destiny, that they get there and they end up a little bit short. Um, but playing with a lot of those guys, it was great to get to know them and fantastic players and these huge careers. But I was harking back to, you know, the best team I was ever on didn't have a lot of superstars, or they at least weren't superstars at the time. Yeah. yeah. Steve Smith was a third-year player. Yeah. Dan Morgan, third-year player. Um, Beppers was just a second-year yeah. player. And I was going to ask you about Julius Peppers, like, how was it, and both of y'all got, both of you got being North Carolina alums, like, how special was he as a talent that you got to see in practice every day on, on the defensive side of the ball? It was, um, you know, you just felt like he, whatever you could do extremely well, he could do it better. And, um, you know, for me, it was terrorizing to have him line up against me, because sometimes, you know, I'm wondering, like, I I'm working my tail off and trying to give a good front right. I got him, I got him, I, I locked him down, I did this or this. Same time, now I want to get him too fired up. Yeah. I'm like, I was this close to losing. I was this close <laughs> to giving up a sack. Um, it was just that special. Yeah. When we first drafted uh, Jordan Gross, Peppers was maybe in his second year, uh, maybe third year. Uh, second year, I believe. Yeah. And so we're out there training camp at Walford down in, um, in Spartanburg. And his first rep, uh, Peppers ran over a rookie right tackle, Jordan Gross, and it, it was horrible. Oh, no. But it could happen to anybody. Yeah, yeah. it just had to happen to the rookie. And, and we're all sitting there thinking, um, you know, sometimes people laugh and guys mess up and this or whatever, but the offensive line, we're like, it could have been me. It could have, yeah. That could have been me. Step to the I'm side. Not anything. I'm going to, you know, dust them off, dust the backside off, tell them, you know, it'd be better next time. But, um, you know, Peppers was just that dominant. Mm. How cool is it for you to have seen now that, because, you know, we talked about it in a couple podcasts ago where, we obviously had honored, you know, Sam Mills as we had. We, you, you could not honor Sam Mills. But then Tepper came in, and there was a lot of those things off the field that he did that you didn't, wouldn't think about, but those tweaks he made that really revived, like, really the fan base really enjoyed, like, the Ring of Honor and yeah. getting to see Jake DeLone, Jordan Gross, Wesley Walls, you know, C. Smith getting the recognition they deserve. How cool was that for you? Because, you know, playing with pretty much, did you, I don't think you played with Walls, did you or did you? Yeah. Yeah, you played uh, with pretty much all those players. Yeah, two seasons. I think he was, he was 0-1, 0-2. Okay. He left for Green Bay, maybe that next year. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so I know I, Walls is one of my good friends. Um, I was really happy for him because when they announced the Hall of Honor, you know, everyone starts thinking, like, who's it going to be or how Walls many was not a mic, yeah. or whatever. Um, and to me, it was I was glad that he picked one from that first six or seven years of the franchise mm-hmm. that was the face of the franchise. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, I mean, he was a touchdown machine. Oh, yeah. And I think young people like around your age, if you're not a huge football fan, you don't realize what an impact he made at the tight end position. Mm-hmm. Anytime that team was close to the goal line, Steve Burline was looking for Wesley Walls. Mm-hmm. He was a dominant tight end. So I was glad to see kind of someone from that era get their due. And then, obviously, um, you know, with Steve Smith and DeLome and Gross, guys that, you know, especially Gross is a lifer here. You know, it's great to see an offensive lineman always walk out here. <laughs> but that 2003 team was really special. Those three guys were so instrumental in that. And then the success they had after um, with getting a lot of wins for this franchise. And they're just great human beings and great in the community. Um, family guys. Uh, Steve Smith still makes his home here. And, he gives back to the community autonomously. And uh, so it's, I thought they were really good choices. And it was just for me, it's, I'm hoping, there's no guarantee they do one this year. Uh-huh. Maybe yeah. it's every year. We were talking about year. that too, yeah. Because it really, no one's ever said, and I think a lot of people are assuming, okay, they'll add another name next year, yeah. two names, and then you're thinking, well, that was all offense. Yeah, so on defense all now. Defense, 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 yeah. you include John Casey, who was, you know, our kicker for yeah. 19 years. Yeah. Um, there's just other names you can throw in there, um, and there's so many good ones. So, it, you know, I think, I think they should do one this year. Mm-hmm. Maybe four names. and maybe Four defensive names. Defense. And then after that, you know, maybe it's every other year, or maybe just year. one guy yeah. at a time. Because you, you, you can easily, like we were talking about, you can easily do, like, you know, I mean, I know he just retired, but still the presence of the other team. I mean, you could put Luke Keekley, then Peppers, and then say, like, uh, Chris Gamble, and then maybe, you know, uh, Mike Rucker, or maybe, uh, you know, depending on just what you think of. I, we, we talked about that, too. Yeah. Think you'll see yourself on that list? No, never. I, was only, <laughs> I, was, I played 13 seasons, yeah. which is a lot longer than most. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Only three with the Panthers. Yeah. So I kind of know my role. Um, <laughs> I was here for three years, but being from North Carolina, mm. settled here. Mm. Um, it's been my home for the last 20 mm. years. But I kind of know how I fall in the high off <laughs> here. The Panthers, uh, great. So, yeah. you know, um, I was happy to be a part of uh, rebounding from 1-15 and, and getting to a Super Bowl. Exactly. Setting the team up for huge success up until about 2010. Yeah. There was a reset. We changed the coach. Coach Rivera getting Cam Newton. Yeah. And we had another nearly a decade of, of some great competitive uh-huh. football. So you've seen almost pretty much all the great success that you've seen at the franchise. You've pretty much been around there for that. Yeah. yeah. And I and I played against some of those great teams early on, like 96 when they went to that NFC Championship yeah. game up in uh, Green Bay, I believe. Um, but being at Houston Oil at the time, I Panthers came down. It might have been one of our last games uh-huh. in the Astrodome before we moved up to Tennessee in 97. And I think they kicked our ass. <laughs> like, it, was, it wasn't even close. Um, so it was, it was a tough loss, but it was, I followed that team closely. Mm-hmm. I knew all the good players on there. And, um, man, they came out of the gate swinging, swinging hard. So Jacksonville for that. Man. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was wild, the fact that they both came out of the gates in their first few years. I think both made the championships in that first year, if I'm not mistaken, which was wild to see. The owners kind of made a little bit of a mistake with um, giving a lot of access to other teams' rosters. That is true, yeah. You could protect about 30 or 35 guys, and after that you could could get some of those players off them. There's so many really good, talented players, and both of them got to pick maybe two first round picks like yeah. one at the very top and one at the end yeah. and it almost set them up in two good situations yeah. because after yeah. a year and I didn't think their of feet that. wet and settled yeah. and routine and everything yeah. both teams in 96 you know ah. got the championship games yeah. like you said so I think when the Texans were at it <laughs> they did not the franchises yeah. you know, it, they they Changed the rules. They brought it down a little yeah. bit. And said, hey, you got to build up the success. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, we're not giving you full. You can't just get right off the bat. Nah. Um, so, i got to ask, as an offensive lineman, I know, especially what we've seen in the Panthers the last decade or so, well, at least for Cam's tenure, obviously we've, we've had in the past, we've had a history of great offensive linemen. You have Ryan Kluge, you have Jordan Grosses. We've also had a history of not so great offensive linemen. And it seems like in Cam's tenure, I mean, he's had, I think the stat was six left tackles in nine years. 
how frustrating is that for you to know the importance of the offensive line and the fact that we are not providing Cam with that that, nece- that necessity? Because that, off- that Super Bowl year, we thought we had it, but it was really just a mirage because we weren't playing really great defensive lines other than J.J. Watt. And then the Super Bowl came, and we realized really quickly it didn't have what it took. Yeah, and I'll, I'm a Cam defender in some ways because um, – done a lot of good things and people weren't really happy with that Super Bowl performance but you know and the offensive line was, was definitely um, they weren't up to the task that defense that year for the Broncos was unbelievable Von Miller, Miller is a beast yeah and it wasn't even Von Miller that, and like most right. of us again too it was uh, DeMarcus Ware yeah, coming off the end and, but you know a couple of plays in the Panthers favor they probably come out of that winning and Cam might get the, the MVP. Yeah. And I say that because it was a second down throw. It was a catch by Jericho Cotri. I don't care who says it wasn't. Yes. It's a catch. Yes. That keeps it from being third and long. And that keeps the sack we- fumble from happening. <laughs> or they're about to get back in this game. Um, I'm not sure if it was right after halftime. Oh. Tolbert fumbled. They just got a first yep. down past the yep. yard line. There's momentum. It was a tight score the whole game. It really yeah. was. People don't believe. People, people don't realize that. How that, close that game was. It was a couple it was garbage. It was a garbage time touchdown in the end. They only had two offensive right. touchdowns. I don't even think that actually. They might have had just they were the one. Set up off of, of turnovers. You know, they won the fumble down there and, and um, scoop and score. I mean, our defense exactly. played so great that game. It's like, Coney Healy had a, I mean, Coney Healy had, had a pick. Our defensive end had a pick. He would have been the MVP of the game, 100%. Yeah, been we were always talking about how right. disappointing the next few years were with him because we're like, oh, this is going to be like, we had Charles we Johnson. catch him on XFL now. I know. We were talking about that. I loved watching Austin Prohl catching the first yeah. touchdown for the Dragons. Yeah. I thought that was so cool because I played, he was a senior when I was a freshman at Providence. So then I fought him through Chapel Hill, him and Bentley Spain. Yeah. You know, through there. And then after I decided not to go to Chapel Hill, after I checked it them, yeah. I uh, stopped following Chapel Hill football that much because, you know, I didn't really have any, any ties to it. But what has it been, how special has it been getting to kind of affect change in Charlotte football, you know, working with Charlotte Christian for a little while and then working with UNC Charlotte, as you said you did? What's that been like? Well, it was, you know, when I first retired from football, I did some coaching, but, um, you know, to me, it's, you know, getting at the pro level, you know, I, I think working with older athletes um, was kind of where I needed to be. I got the opportunity to be at the Blues in Charlotte, and um, it's been fantastic. This, you know, we, we, we started at, like, a um, brand-new franchise, FCS team, um, move up to FBS level within two years, yeah. and then... I know we got here the last coach was that the foundation was left so good there that the new coach came in here and we get a bowl win. That's just some gratifying. We can never get a bowl again. To, to, to get on the, you know, to play our first game basically in 2013 and you're wondering, are we going to have enough guys on the kickoff return team? Yeah. You've never had one ever. <laughs> yeah. No live action. Yeah. You've done it in practice a million times. Yeah. But can we get everyone out on the field to, you know, seven years later? You know, celebrating on the field after beating the Marshall team that was battling for the conference championship yeah, yeah. Uh, on a cold and rainy night and get that, you know, bowl eligible. So, but it's, it's been fantastic. I love my time at Charlotte Christian. My kids were there. And I didn't just coach football. Like, it was girls soccer, middle school lacrosse. I had started middle school uh, lacrosse teams. Later became really? we transitioned to high school. Okay. And then after a year of kind of being like a club team, they let us play full out in high school lacrosse. Yeah. And it was cool um, building that. You know, that's just what I did up at UC Charlotte, helped them build to a, a pretty good football yeah. team. Now it's getting a lacrosse team at, at Charlotte Christian. Oh, wow. Part of this because my middle son absolutely loved it, and I love the time I get to spend with him. But um, did a lot of fundraising with the school and different things. So, I think it's just the love of Charlotte. I, I like this town a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, our family grew up here. Mm-hmm. Our kids know it is home. And, mm-hmm. uh, I think it's just been so cool to, to affect a lot of different areas, whether it's the high school level, middle school level, or college level, or my work I do with the Panthers. It's really cool to be on all these different levels. Yeah. And speaking of which, like 
how's it been for you now starting your own podcast now with Al, with former Panther Al Wallace? Like, can you speak on how, how that's been for you? Um, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, we we run an hour. We, we keep telling ourselves we need to try and maybe hit forty five minutes or fifty minutes. <laughs> and we always hit an hour. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Oh, we're that's always that's fair because you, you get you get lost in the conversation, yeah. and at the time you don't even, you forget you're recording a podcast, and then when we do it, like I we know. forget we're talking, yeah. and, and then it's been an hour. What's been good? Um, it's good help for people. I think they gave us good advice that there's times that. The best ones really um, bring you back week after week. You have a clear focus of kind of where you're going. Um, keep the people entertained, obviously, the number one thing. They want to be driving somewhere, they're working out, and they want to forget about what they're doing for the next hour and hear some, you know, for Panther centric talk or uh, fantasy football mm-hmm. you know, advice, things like that. Um, so for us, it was it was kind of an easy segue because we felt like in this area for the Panthers, there's no one really talking about X's and O's. No, we Wells found knows out. The defense. Yeah. Uh, I know a lot about the offense. Yeah. Yeah. We could go back and forth, and it was just a really good fit. And then um, we had another, I do another podcast with Taylor Davis. Um, we had some guests that was called Inside Voices for the Carolina Panthers. Okay. And um, that one we just we do a lot of preview for the next game. Um, yeah. So it, both different, but had a kind of focus on what it was about. But had a lot of fun along the way, a lot of good laughs, yeah. and trying to get some good guests. And it's been fun. Um, always a lot to learn. I'm always listening to other people. Like, oh, that's good. How can I get like them? Um, and so you just, you just gotta keep trying to hone the craft. And, and the best part about it is, you know, you know work on something that you really care about. So then going into this, you know, I, I, we found out through this podcast, we're starting the offseason, really the main things, you can, the Panthers actually provided us with a good amount of storylines, which has been pretty helpful, you know, all, the, yeah. all yeah. everything with Tepper and everything with Cam, everything with McCaffrey, you know, all this kind of different stuff, it's been able, we've been able to talk about a lot, but the main things you really kind of focus on is that draft and, you know, free agency. What are, what's one or two things you want to see the Panthers do in the draft or in free agency? O-line, D-line. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. I don't thank want you. anyone thank to lose focus of... Oh, thank God. Of what's really important and what got us into trouble last season. Yeah, um, thank you. you. Say what you want about the coaches or the scheme, yeah. or this and that. But if if you got guys up front on both sides of the ball that are just ass kickers, you're going to win ball games. Yes. Um, and so, you know, for me, don't get enamored by somebody running a four three five forty or someone that's six five that can jump a forty inch vertical or whatever. Just show me someone that's tough that can make a tackle, cause a quarterback fits or defensive lineman you know, drive them offensive lineman in the back feet like just somebody that can set the tone and be the guy that, that other guys can follow yeah um, that's gotta be it and when you're picking number seven there's opportunity oh, yeah. especially you have a really good chance of not nabbing the best defensive interior line interior lineman um through this draft, which I think coming out of um, Auburn is just a phenomenal player around. And so uh, I think offensive line I'd love to see, but picking a number seven out of it, the best one will be there at that position. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all speculation. There might be yeah. trades and different things that happen. We'll see. But man, you know, I just, if, if you're putting your money where your mouth is and say you want to build for sustained success, uh, you got you got some good skill players on offense. You got DJ Walker, Samuel, and Christian McCaffrey. Ian Thomas, I think, is going to be a very good tight end. Yeah. Uh, you're probably not going to get your guy quarterback you really love. Yeah, no, nice set. And <laughs> to move up, you're going to have to get so much away. And on the defensive side, um, you know, obviously you'd like to replace with a little quickly, but Shaq, I think, could be a very good player there. Yeah. And, um, Secondary, if you keep right there, and obviously Dante can get his, his act together. <laughs> yeah. Trey Boston, maybe re sign him. I hope so. Yes. I hope so. You know what? Burns is on the outside. Christian Miller, um, you know, you could opt to maybe keep Bruce Irvin. You know, who knows? Yeah. But there's pieces there. But man, you need somebody that. Yeah, when I was an offensive lineman, I'm standing across from him. There's fear in my eyes. Yeah. This guy, you know, Aaron Donald type. Yeah. Somebody oh my that just, is dominant. Yeah. Chris Jones. Oh. I mean, he came back healthy for the Chiefs, yeah. and he was one of the main reasons yeah. they got where they were. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah. honestly. 100%. Yeah. It wasn't Frank Clark, I can tell you that. I mean, he helped, but... No, exactly. Football, and that's a problem people forget about. They wanted to make these sexy picks in the draft of free agency, but football is one in the trenches, and people have, have been quick to forget that. Um, again, I think we're about to run out of time, but again, um, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, this has been so awesome, and do you want I know you're technically 
really our competition, but do you want to plug your podcast real quick? <laughs> Just for our <laughs> listeners. Well, yes. Um, we're, I'm still doing Inside Voices because we're carrying that through the offseason. That's what Taylor Davis and myself is part of the Carolina Panthers Not Podcast Network. Um, but we're only doing those monthly. Okay. Now, so you guys can flood the market <laughs> with all your Panthers. Oh, we will. I promise you we will. We've got another one coming up early in March. Okay. So, um, podcast just check us out yes sir well thank you all so much uh next week we'll be back with our original crew uh, we'll have jeff and tyler back with us and until next time everybody keep pounding